Restaurant Unstoppable. What the most successful restaurateurs know that you don't. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, the president and CEO of SSA Food Service and Design and Consulting, Ken Schwartz. My man, are you feeling unstoppable today? I am, Eric. Yes. Good to I, see you. I cannot wait to get into your story. You have a really unique perspective. Traditionally, I interview successful restaurateurs, but there, this industry, there's just so much that is cons- like a part of this industry um and i don't ever i don't get to talk to you every day a design expert so and not just any design expert one of the top 12 designers in the world according to my research so i, I know we're in good company i know this is going to be a great interview and i cannot wait to get into it but let's get that motivational inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra what do you got for us so i think our the one mantra that we always stick with that that always kind of bubbles to the surface is we take our work incredibly serious, but not ourselves. Mm, why Dive into that. Why is that so important for you? Because it's more about the work and mm. the client and the result than it is about the firm and, and, the ego. and accolades. In yeah. fact, we although we've won some awards, we've never in the history of our firm submitted for an award. Because again, it, the, the, to us, the, the prize is you know, a great project for the client or even better, the client calling us back on the next project and go, you know, the first project was awesome. We'd like to get you involved in the next project. So I I love this. And I think we can probably pull a a lesson early on in the the culture of your organization. How do you guys, I mean, being, having all these accolades, getting all this recognition, how do you not let your egos get in the way? And how do you, do you echo this, this quote day in and day out? Is it something that you bring to the surface often? Uh, You know, we don't, it's not something we have to yell or that we have written on the walls as a reminder, or we tap each other on the shoulder and like, Hey, down boy, down. Yeah. It's it's just always one of those things that, that have always been, I don't know if I grew up that way or not, right? To just like stay humble, yeah. you know, but but also instilled in me was to do the very best work possible. Yeah. So it's kind of those two together. Um, and for us, you, you know, it, it is the client's project. Yeah. It's our work and it's our creativity. But at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're helping to birth their vision. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's just like like if you if you make it about the work, if you put that time and energy into the thing and doing the thing well, the rest kind of falls in place. So you don't want to divert that energy into ego or into yourself or you know it. it I think we can get lost in that sometimes and being worried about what people think of us, right? Instead of just doing the thing that we're supposed to do. Well, you know, and a lot of times on projects too, you you'll get a a high dollar developer. Uh, high dollar architect, high dollar interior design, yep. high dollar operator, and there's enough egos at the table already, <laughs> yeah. right? I, they don't need mine on top of that. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of times what we'll do is, you know, we'll facilitate. Y- you know, we'll just listen and facilitate because you may have a developer who has a certain budget in mind and you have an operator who maybe could care less about the budget because it's not their money. And somewhere in between, we have to draw something that makes sense for both. I love it. Great way to get this thing started. So where does it make sense to start sharing your story? Because I know you have a unique entry into this, this industry. I know your, your dad had a, a business that was closely related Close, to Close, but you didn't, you didn't go far enough back. Okay, go further back. So um, I got into the business from my mom's side of okay. the family. Uh, my mom's uh, grandfather, my great-grandfather... Um, uh, came to the U.S. Uh, from Romania okay. in the late 1800s, uh, and in 1897 started an equipment and supply dealership here in Tampa. Okay, and I grew up in that business. So, equipment and supply. What kind of equipment and supply were we talking about back in 1897? Well, in 1897, I don't know that the equipment was so sophisticated. <laughs> I think it was uh, maybe a pile of firewood and a pan. I, you know, well, but more uh, about supply than so much. Yeah, but there, there probably was, you, you know, some equipment, right? In, Shovel. Well, even <laughs> do, if you think about it, like like original ice boxes, yeah. right? You know that you actually had to put ice into. And uh, that was insulated, you, you know. So I imagine it was probably it was probably state of the art then, yeah. very primitive now. So was it re- was that business that he started in 1897 related to food and beverage, or was it more a general supply and equipment? No, it's primarily related to food and beverage, right? So for commercial kitchens, whether it be you know a restaurant or a pub or government, military, that was that was how their business started. Beautiful. But I got to tell you, before they actually opened the business, 
I, I had heard stories that my great grandfather was selling stuff from a push cart, right? We'd just push it around town and sell it from a push cart. I mean, that's how I think how all great things start from where they can, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, when we're getting into this industry, we, we look at the greats, you know, uh, the, the best restaurateurs, the best design firms, and we compare ourselves to that. But they didn't start there, you know? Like, everybody has to start from somewhere. I think people lose sight of that. Even the best started from, like, a pop-up or a push cart. But I whatever. go a little deeper than where they are at the moment. I go into... What made them the best or what made them special and how did that happen, right? Mm. Not, oh, yeah, here's a guy that's got 30 restaurants or 100 restaurants and, you know, every casino or every resort wants to have one of his restaurants and, wow, he's doing so great today. But what was the tipping point, right? What, what was that person doing at the moment somebody noticed them? What were they doing to get noticed, and, it, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a restaurateur or a bartender or a DJ, right, or an architect or an interior designer, because there are some great firms out there and there are some great artists out there. Yeah. Well, let's take the school of thought and apply it to your grandfather. How, I don't know how much you know about your grandfather's story, um, but what was it that that was really unique about what your grandfather was doing that, you know, helped him get discovered or, or helped him take it to the, you know, to where you know, it, it was when you were there as a kid. So I don't, so I don't know. My great grandfather passed away long before I was born and growing up, I grew up in that business. Right. So, you know, in the summers I would work there in the summers and, um, on holidays work there, uh, whenever they did it, the once a year they did inventory, right. They pulled all of us in, which we dreaded, like <laughs> dreaded. I'm like, if I count another knife and fork and you know, I'm going to, I'm going to use one of the knives on me, you know, <laughs> And uh, but I think for them, I think probably what was unique about their business was uh, time and place, supply and demand. I think uh, nothing like that really existed. And, you know, like every company, right, like back then, you just start off regionally, right, kind of taking care of your hometown and and then your hometown got bigger. Yeah. And then it connected with another town. And so you service that town also. And I think that's how they evolved over time. And uh in name, the company still exists today. My family sold the business uh, when I was a junior in high school, and uh, that company just sold it uh, maybe about two years ago to another group. So it still exists. I, I, I don't even know the people that own it, but, you know, just growing up in it and, and uh, you know, as a kid, we went out to dinner almost every night of the week because, you know, the family had so many customers you know i grew up that way and even today well pre-covid my wife and i would go out to dinner probably five or six nights a week because it's just the way i grew up and but i also look at it as field research mm -hmm. you know i i i want to see what people are doing well and it's it's um it, it's funny how uh how guests of restaurants perceive what's good right uh, some people have uh, a, a very mediocre palate. Some have a very sensitive palate. Some are, uh, you know, if it's visually, right, if the plate's completely full and it's a mountain, I consider this a great place. Or, you know, if it's a very small portion on a giant plate and very artistic, somebody else may go, this place is awesome. So what, you know, in the guest eyes, what makes it great? And so those are the things that I want to see. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking at the operation because my wife's like, you're, you're always like working when we go out, you know, <laughs> yeah. and we go to sit down. She's like, I know you want to sit here so you can see into the kitchen or you can see this. And I just, you know, I just watch. And, you know, sometimes I have to scratch my head and I'm like, why are they making this so hard? They could tweak one or two little things that would make this so much easier and make the guest experience so much greater. And, you know, if you took a minute and even looked anywhere on our website, one of the, probably one of our mantras is enhancing the guest experience. Okay. Right. And, and, you know, as, as a design firm specializing in food service, people would be like, what do you have to do at all with the guest experience? And I'm like, well, I feel like we kind of have a lot to do with it's it. It's all connected. If, if we don't give you the proper tools to help you deliver then you're not going to meet the guest experience. In fact, you're going to you're going to detract from it. Yep. And so, how do we help you enhance getting orders produced and served on time? 
How do we make sure that the cold stuff is cold and the hot stuff is stu- is is hot? And that the dishes come out spotless clean at the end of the dishwasher. And how can you do it as efficiently or as efficiently as possible? Right? How do we do it with less energy mm-hmm. and maybe less people and and uh, you know maybe it's it's less chemicals and more natural and in a better environment and and all of those things uh, that that want people to come work in your establishment because they see opportunity. They see opportunity for their own growth, but they see opportunity for the company growth based on just observing operational yeah, successes. And that's been one of the biggest lessons I've learned right there, that part you just mentioned at the end, is that the people who are at the top of the their, their, the game in the restaurant industry know that it's about creating opportunity for others. It's about getting out of the way and finding out how you can create opportunity for others. And, and do, what, what, what goes through your mind when I say that? So it's it's pretty interesting, right? So so uh, as our firm was growing, I started the firm uh, with myself and two employees, and we got we got very busy and very tired. And I realized, you know, there's only so much work three people can produce in a day, in a week, in a year. And I actually went and met with a couple of architectural buddies who we were doing work for, and. Uh, I asked them, I said, you guys are with big firms, national, international firms. At what point do you determine we need to add people and how do you manage the people and manage the work and control the people and control the quality? And so they shared a couple of insights with me. And then I started, I, I started then not only equating that to our firm, but also looking and equating it to our clients' operations. Yeah. And business is business at the end of the day. These lessons apply. They, they totally. All and, and, you know, and how you treat people and, and, you know, how you want them to be treated. And it's funny. I, um, I had a client who uh, is extremely successful. The family's been in the restaurant business for 100 years. Uh, and one of the things that we were discussing one day, I, uh, I made a suggestion to him, uh, and he looked at me and he said, you know, Ken, when you've been running restaurants for 50 years, he said, then maybe you can give me some advice. Burn. And I was taken back a minute and I said, well, I appreciate that. I said, I don't kn- know where it's really coming from. I said, but I'll share something with you. I said, you know, last year, I said, we designed 250 food service operations in roughly 50 weeks. And I said, I don't know how many you designed or built last year. I said, we worked on one for you, so I'm assuming it's just one, unless you have another one or two that you're hiding. And I said, and I'm not saying that to slam you, but what I am sharing with you is that out of the 250, we were dealing with 249 other clients who had very different perspectives on things, very different insight. And I said, you only know what you know. I know what you know, and what all of our other clients know. And I'm like, I was just trying to share a little bit of their experience with you. And if you don't want to hear it, I get it. And he he looked at me and he said, yeah, I'm sorry. He said, maybe that came off incorrectly. He said, you know, one of the things that my father always told me is never leave a, never let a customer leave hungry. And I said, wow, that's a big statement. I said, but tell me what that means to you. Mm. He's like, well, never let them mean hungry. I said, no, no, no. But like, what does that mean in terms of what you serve and how you serve and the portions? And because I know their portions are very big. And he said, yeah, he's like, load up the plate and never have anybody, you know, now in social media, right? Write a review that we didn't get enough or the food was great. There was so much I got to take it home. And eat. and I looked at him and I said, well, I don't run 50 restaurants. I don't run any. I said, but, you know, we design and consult. I said, can I ask you a couple of questions? He said, yeah. And I said, I want to think about what your dad told you in a, in a, from a different perspective. Never let the guest leave hungry. I said, that didn't, he didn't say over serve the guest, give them more than they expect. He just said, never let them leave hungry. I said, so if you make really great product and you provide really great service and, and your entree portions were a little bit smaller, would you anticipate that maybe more people would spend money on dessert. He's like, yeah, probably. Yeah. Higher profit item, right. spend more money. I said, are they even, are they, would they leave more or less hungry than if you put a mountain of something on a plate? And he's like, touche, good point. He's like, I yeah. get it, right? And so, you know, and, and I was talking to another very well-known celebrity restaurateur on Monday uh, about doing some work for him. 
And he's like, oh, Ken, we have all these projects going. He said, you know, we'd love to get you involved. And he's like, we'd like to get a bid from you. And I said, well, we, we don't bid on work. I said, we'll provide a proposal. And our fee is what we think it's going to take to get you where you need to be. And I said, if you're comparing that with somebody who sells restaurant equipment, who's also trying to do design, uh, I said, that's like me coming and spending $28 on a hamburger at one of your places, or I can say, listen, man, I can go to McDonald's and I can get a quarter pounder for, uh, you know, I don't yeah. know, maybe $2 and 50 cents. Yeah. Why don't I do that? And he, he says to me, he's like, well, it's not going to be the same. And I said, exactly. Yeah. Right. That's exactly my point. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. I, I, sorry, do, do you have more? I don't want to cut you short. Keep going. So as we were talking about this, I said, listen, there are, there are, you're very experienced, and I'm 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 interested in learning from your experience, but I'm also very interested in sharing what we know also. Yeah. And uh, he's and it was funny when I twisted it that way. He's like, "Yeah, it'll be interesting to know more about that." Yeah. Two right? things come to mind for me mm -hmm. listening to you share the story. One is that it's all about you. you got to get the perspective. Like learning in this industry never ends. You got to get perspective from different people, and you're constantly learning. And that's that's one of the big lessons from the story you just you shared us. And the other big one is that you got to charge what food's worth. You know, you can't give things away. We we operate with really small margins. And, the, and this came out in your story with the the person that was talking about giving you the bid. You got to charge what you're worth, and it, it applies to food too. Like we, I think we get into trouble because we give a lot away, and that's one of the reasons why we're in the situation that we're in, where people aren't making enough money doing the work we're doing because we're not charging what it's worth. What are your thoughts on that? So you know, I'm gonna I'll share a couple of perspectives because you know we. Uh, before this started, we said, you know, I don't know if we're going to talk about, you know, what's transpired with COVID or, you know, vision post COVID, et cetera. But I've, but during some of these calls that we would have these kind of weekly COVID cocktail party check-in calls, right. That I, that I mentioned, right. We would do as an organ, as an association, you know, and, and listen, there were people on it from, from all around the world because we have consultants from all around the world. And, you know, one of the, and we realized, right, there are a lot of restaurants that are going to close that are never going to reopen, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's sad. And and uh, But listen, there are a lot of other businesses outside of the food service industry that closed and will never open again. Also equally as sad. But in a but from a food for, for, excuse me from a food service perspective, one of the things I said is, uh, I, I said uh, I'm baffled by kind of this ongoing uh, statistic for restaurants that basically say, you know, a range of food costs should be somewhere between 28, not higher than 32%, and food and labor combined should be 52 to 54%, not more or less, and then, you know, maybe rent is 5 or 6% and yada, 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 and you start to, you know, you start to tick away at, at what was 100% gross revenue, and a lot of these restaurateurs were barely making money or barely breaking even, and a lot of them were slowly losing money, burning through money. So when all of this started at COVID and some of our clients were looking to kind of either reopen or open where they could do delivery, I shared with them a couple of thoughts. I said, cut your menu. I said, you don't need to offer your whole menu because your audience has just gotten much, yeah. much smaller and your staff is much smaller. I said, the other thing to consider is, is take the high dollar center plate protein. And I said, cut the portion by 10 or 15% and consider raising the price by 10 or 15%. Now, if you think about somebody who's losing five or 6% a year, just that slightest adjustment is a difference between losing money and now making a profit. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I had a lot of people say, hmm, that's a great idea. And then I had a lot of people ask, how do I compete? How do I, how do I now still compete? Yeah. And I said, Listen, if, if you still think that you're competing on price for a thing, you're completely thinking the wrong way. You got to be thinking about what is the experience that you're yes. delivering because people are buying the experience. And a couple of things I said to them is you have to think about what that experience looks and feels like when they come into your restaurant or to your restaurant. Right now we're sitting outside. I said, but you got to also think about what that experience is like when it's delivered. And I said, it's a very, very different experience. And I said, nobody wants to eat something that's been delivered that they feel like was somebody else's doggy bag. Yeah, and, it, keep going. I think and I, I said, what I mean by that is, I said, package up everything that you're going to sell delivered. Drive it around town. 
take it to your family, open it up and see what it looks like and see if it still looks as appetizing as it did when you stuck it in the box or in the bowl or the pan or whatever it was. And I said, you may have to retool some of that because you, you're just thinking, well, we can use the same eight by eight styrofoam container for everything. And you can't. And, yeah. and again, it's, it is, even though it's disposable and trash, right? It's still an extension of your brand. So what it, what is that brand that you're trying to to deliver? Yeah, and I, I I agree with so much that you just share with us. And I think one of the the big like you mentioned like a lot of restaurants closed. Unfortunately, I mean a lot of those restaurants that closed during COVID nineteen were on the the verge of closing. Were a lot of it was dead weight, and they were headed in that path anyway. And COVID nineteen just expedited a lot of things, right? It just made it accelerated. Was, yeah, yeah, it just accelerated a lot of things. Um, a lot of negative things like like people that were just on their way out or just weren't competitive enough or who were struggling to get by but also it accelerated a lot of good things that were in the process of happening um and i think that you can either focus on all the bad that came from covid19 or you can focus on, on the new opportunity that is has come as a result of covid19 almost every time there's disaster there's a new growth of like opportunity thereafter and i think if you you can choose to see whether it's a disaster or a new op- a new point of opportunity. And just changing that perspective will have a world of difference. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, listen, Eric, you hit the nail right on the head. I, I think people that dwell on, oh, my God, this is awful. This is sinking the ship. What are we going to do? How are we going to get out of it? Has just stepped, you know, neck deep into wet cement. And they're just going to expire there. Yeah. Right? There are those of us who are like, all right, here's a problem, here's a challenge. What are the solutions to work through it or work around yeah. it? And I think those are the one, you know, those are the people who emerge um, and continue, right? Yeah. They're the ones who continue to live at, at whatever maybe little bit of life support they continue to be on, you know, versus cutting the life support cord and, you know, just kind of floating out to oblivion. But I do think... Um, People who are creative, right, are always looking for other solutions. And, you know, other solutions don't necessarily mean it's a, it's a, it's a solution to a problem. Uh, one of the, it's funny, you said, hey, what are your mantras? And I'm like, I don't know, we don't really have any, but, you know, <laughs> I came up with a couple. But one of the things that we always say here, um, because, you know, if you do look at some of the stuff on our website, some of our bespoke stuff, all of those one-of-a-kind creations came out of thought, onto paper, into discussion, uh, into f- into fabrication, and into r- reality, right? And and every one of them is unique in their own way. And so for us, one of the things that 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 um, I realized a long time ago is that a lot of designers, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's food service consultants, architects, interior designers, even engineers, most of them will take the path of least resistance and kind of always do what they've always done. And one of the things that we say here uh, is that you can never say this is the way that we always do it. We don't, we, don't, we don't say that here. What we do say is this is the way we do it at the moment until we have a better solution. Kaizen, right? So we're all, yeah, we're all, yeah, we're always looking for is there a better way to do. And, and listen, we've even brought that mantra into our own internal processes. And, and, you know, one of the things COVID did for us, because we were we were designing at a thousand miles an hour at the end of 2019. And, you know, end of February, beginning of March, we went from a thousand miles an hour to three. And, you know, just work just came to a standstill. And we said, OK, what are we what are we going to do now? Right. What are we going to do? And. You know, fortunately for us, we had a couple of very, very good years, and so uh, we were very, f- uh, we were financially strong. Uh, and and I made just kind of a quiet personal commitment that I'm going to keep keep the team together. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you know, that as a food service, as a lay person looking into a food service design firm, there are not a lot of us out there. And so once we have a team, and that team uh, coexists and works and collaborates really well. Uh, you don't want to lose anybody. And we had a lot invested in our people and in, in a lot of our processes. And as things slowed down, we, said, we, we talked amongst ourselves and said, how can we take what we're doing and make the, make the process better? So in the last year, we actually invested a lot of time and a lot of money 
uh, in between working on the few projects we still had going. And we actually created some new processes that make us incredibly efficient. And we would have never had that opportunity had we not had this little breather. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's changed the way we produce work. And yeah. now it doesn't change the way we create. It just really, it, it makes our production so much more efficient that we actually have more time to step back yeah. and create, which is really where we like to be. Listening to you talk, I can't help but think about this mentality that if you're not growing, you're getting worse because everything around you is progressing. So if you're staying still and everything else around you is moving forward, you're moving back relatively right so yeah. you've got to constantly be learning you've got to con and i say these are our core values in the network we are students we are educators like we're constantly learning we're constantly sharing what we're learning with others to make ourselves better right uh, i love this i want to bring it back to your story though because i do try to keep yeah. a, a little <laughs> bit of a chronological uh, flow here so you you come from a lineage of entrepreneurs uh your dad took over Oh, your grand, your no, grand, my mom did. My mom, mom took, took over, over the okay. family business. My father was never involved in the business. My father was a uh, was a CPA. Okay. And uh, and as I said, my family sold the business when I was a junior in high school. I was the youngest of four. Uh, none of my siblings, although they had all worked in the family business, were really interested in being involved in the family business. Yeah. And I think. You know, the writing was on the wall, right? Three out of the four aren't interested. And so the family's like, all right, let's sell it to somebody, right? Okay. And, and, and you know, meanwhile, you know, this little junior high kid was like, hey, what about me? What about me? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, we sold it already. And I was like, well, okay. Um, all right. I got to rethink my yeah. life a little bit. So what made you pick this path of restaurant design? Why was this calling to you? And how long did it take you to realize that this was your path? Well, it, was, it wasn't at first. So um, I was actually fortunate enough to to attend a uh, a technical high school and the technical high school that I wanted to go to offered an architectural class um, that was really kind of like any other so the our academic studies were half the day and then this architectural class was the other three three and a half hours a day so I was in this architectural class three and a half hours a day for four years and so literally when I got out of high school I, I had what I see now as almost the equivalent of a, of a degree in architecture. Or at least an internship, it, right? Well, yeah. uh, and, and when I was a junior in high school, I had designed my first two homes. The first one is still built. It's, it's over on Anna Maria Island, and uh, I drive by it every now and then and go, yeah, I, I, I remember doing that. And, um, so it, you knew early on that, that you wanted to design. My heart was always kind of in architecture. Okay. And so uh, I went on... Uh, to study architecture, uh, my father was also pushing me to into accounting. So when I was in uh, when I was in college, uh, my father really uh, pushed me to consider accounting. And while I was going to college locally, um, my oldest brother, who's also a CPA, uh, was working for my father. Said, you know, why don't you why don't you come work for the firm? And I'm like, I I'm not really interested in being an, an accountant. Yeah. I'm I'm not. It's funny, then, I wasn't really a spreadsheet kind of person. I wasn't a calculator kind of person. Although in college, you know, I, I aced uh, algebra. I aced geometry. I aced uh, calculus, right? I mean, it just kind of came to me naturally. You're good at it, but it wasn't necessarily. But it good. wasn't like how I wanted to earn a living. Yeah. I say then, right? I, yeah. said, I said then. Yeah. Now it's a different story. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up working for my, in my father's firm for about two and a half, three years. Uh, it was a, It was a terrific business education, yeah. right? Because I really didn't have that. And uh, in college, so in college, I also studied parallel accounting and economics. And uh, almost on, as I was getting close to wrapping up college, my very last year, a company offered me a job and I said, hey, no, thank you. Um, and they came back a couple of times. Uh, it, it was actually a guy that I had met in college his family had moved down here uh, and, and bought a restaurant supply company and really needed help. Okay. And uh, I, I fought it, fought it, fought it. They made the money so good that I'm like, I, I, I don't think I can stay in school any longer. <laughs> so I went to work for them, and I worked for them for a couple of years. And then the son and I uh, realized that there was a, a, um, a value in this kind of independent food service design and consulting. 
So together, he and I started the firm. Okay. Uh, so let's put it, let's tap the brakes real yeah. quick there. Um, some of the things that I, I pulled uh, that I want to unpackage a little bit more. My ears perked up every time you mentioned CPA and accounting because I've noticed a correlation with my guests. Whenever there is a CPA in the family, you know, like it, if you and if you don't have one in the family, budget for it early on. Having that CPA on your team or at least access to an accountant or somebody who's good with numbers on your team who knows that financial structure is key to success. And what were some of the biggest lessons you learned uh, from your dad, from this firm uh, that you think set you up for success as a business owner? (laughs) <laughs> uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> I'm just the, the one or two of the biggest nuggets that you think. I'm telling you, probably the biggest thing my father instilled into me is that the uh, the quality of the work has got to be pristine, uh, and you always deliver the work on time. Mm. Always. always. Now, listen, that's coming from a CPA who's up against government-mandated deadlines, right? In the design world, it's somebody else mandating the deadlines, but we became – uber sensitive to that as as i got into the industry right into the design part one of the things that i learned is is my um beloved peers if you will you know and i'll i'll be nice about that fail miserably at delivering on time and even to this day when we're when we're marketing one of the things one of the the biggest headlines that we spend the most time on relative to marketing our firm is what differentiates us Mm -hmm. and and one of those big headlines is Delivering the work not only on time, but two to work two to four weeks in advance, so the rest of the design team has some time to review it, decipher it, etc. Versus delivering it on the day that it's due with everybody else who's never even seen what you've produced. Yeah, and guess what? Those other design firms are bidding on this work that say they can do it cheaper and faster. Always, almost always end up extending whatever they say they're going to do, right? It always goes on. It happens, right? And, you know, if you think about it, you you know, listen, we work on very small projects, right? And a a small project might be like a Starbucks coffee bar in in the lobby of a hotel, right? That would be considered a very small project to we're working on a very large resort now. I think we have 17 or 18 F&B venues. So if you start to think about a project that's $300, $350 million budget, and the one piece that's holding up the project are are the design documents to get to a permit and the one piece of the design documents that is the catalyst for holding it up is the food service consultant because they haven't finished their stuff on time to get to the engineers the architects and the interior designers eventually people stop calling you yeah and so you, you know we became very very sensitive to that very very early on and again some was there the, a reason why you became sensitive to it? Was there a bad experience? Well, be, no, because when we're talking to prospective clients, there is this kind of guilt by association, and I, I can sense it. They don't even have to say it. And, and I just look at them, and I would just ask, you know, in your experiences with other food service designers, how many of them, if any, have ever delivered the work on time? And they're like, yeah, we have a contentious relationship. <laughs> and I said, well, let me share with you how we work. And, and in, in almost 30 years, we've never missed a deadline because wow. we're always a couple of weeks ahead. Yeah, I love that. Uh, so deliver the work on time and attention to detail. I don't know if that was the exact words you used. Uh, um, delivering pristine, pristine quality. quality. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what, anything else from lessons from working in your dad's firm, uh, being a CPA, uh, having that in your family. That uh, one of the other things, well, yeah, one of the other things he instilled was, uh, and listen, my brother and sister hear this, they're going to laugh, is keeping your commitments. Mm. And Definitely. and what he meant by that was, is yeah, you know, if you borrow money from the bank, yeah, you're obligated to pay it back, right? And it was funny. One of the other things he said to me is, he said, he said one thing is always for sure. He's like, you never forget who you owe money to, and somebody who owes you money never forgets, even though they may say, oh, I forgot I owed you that 20 bucks. Down deep, they've never really forgotten, right? And those are some things that have always stuck with me. But but some of those things that he he would say, you know, then, 30 years ago, um, still kind of makes sense today. I love it. Um, you also talked about the significance of seeing that there was an uh, – almost like a hole in the market or you saw that there, there's some value you could deliver by combining t- a couple of things that just weren't being done at that time. Yeah. Um, get into the significance of just trying to find a niche into fill holes in markets and how that sets you up for success. So I did feel like um, uh, um, that there was an opportunity for 
better food service design, thoughtful food service design, not just let's plop in these couple of pieces of equipment, but let's put the pieces of equipment in in a way that they actually make logical sense. How is this station working versus that station? And, and, and how will it be populated with staff? And how will it work, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, those, those once a year Easter Sundays that are three times a week, right? Yeah. How, will it, how will it function fully staffed, but also take a look and say, how can this function with partial staff on on the slower nights, right? Why the, is that the, important to consider? Well, because you, you know, on the slower nights, when when revenue is less, how do you do it with less cost, mm-hmm. right? You're still paying the rent, still a hundred percent, even yeah. if you've only sat fifty percent of your seats, yeah. right? So, so what are some of those controllable costs, right? You're still going to serve the same food at the same cost, et cetera. The lights are still going to cost you the same. How can you control cost if you have lower revenue on those nights? And if you can, if you can reduce some of the labor on those nights and still deliver, uh, then I think that's a win-win. And so, so we look at some of that and, and look and, and, and anticipate how this thing can also work with fewer people on slower days. What are one or two of the controllable costs that most people with just that don't, don't have the experience overlook that you're always like, when you come in, you're like, here it is again, the thing that was overlooked that we, you know, is there anything that comes to mind as I yeah, said? Yeah, there's a couple. And I talk to every client on every project about this. I've, I've probably had this discussion five times already this week with different clients. And it's it's a couple. The, the biggest is ventilation. Okay. So uh, cooking exhaust ventilation. And, you know, for, for most people, for most restaurateurs, you know, they're like, it's a stainless steel box that hangs from my ceiling that I'm required to have by the government. I don't really know what it does. I don't know what it's supposed to do. (laughs) It's very expensive. I'm just gonna buy the cheapest one Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be done with it. Well, there are companies out there that make super high efficiency systems. And yes, they actually cost a little bit more. And it's funny, I use this analogy all the time and I'm like, you know, Eric, if I was gonna write a spec for you, and uh, because you wanted a new vehicle. And I said, L- hey, let us write a spec for you so you don't get the wrong thing. And you'll be like, hey, Ken, that'd be awesome. And I'm like, okay, here's the spec. Four pneumatic tires, an upholstered seat, padded steering wheel, internal combustion engine. And you're thinking, yeah, you know, like I want that, you know, I, 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 I want the McLaren or, you know, I'd love the new Defender or, you know, I'd love the cool Mercedes. They all fit the spec. But you know what else fits the spec? Snapper riding lawnmower fits the spec. Yeah. And guess what? It's a lot more cheaper than any of those other things I mentioned. So why not get that thing to take a cross-country trip? It's cheaper. And so part of what I share with clients is I said, why would you shortchange anything in your kitchen? It is the machine that prints money for you. Yeah. Or it's the machine that's going to eat your money up. And so things like vent- like high-efficiency ventilation systems also impact air conditioning and heating and and not just the electric bill but more importantly the amount of additional electricity or or air conditioning and heating that you need and so these these cheaper less costly systems cost you greatly month after month after month and the high efficiency systems have a payback of 18 to 24 30 months and then the rest of that cost is profit yeah that you'll never see if you make the mistake. Let's do let's do a shout out real quick. Name a high efficiency ventilation system that comes to mind when you say that. Okay. Halton. Halton. Okay. Yeah. Did, I say it, did I say it one more time? Halton. Halton. All right. Cool. Yeah. A little shout out there. Yeah. I'll tag you. Because the funny thing is, and these guys, um, uh, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, I was going to say they're friends of mine. Yeah. Right. And people are going to go, well, yeah, that's why he uses their stuff because they're friends. But you know, this is a very interesting industry, in that. I've, I've obtained a lot of friends along the way within this industry, whether they're at the manufacturing level, at the client level, peop, architects, uh, engineers, developers, people that we work with over time, 
become friends over time. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's almost like you want to continue to perform better for them because well, you have yeah. kind of a personal and, relationship. And birds of the same feather tend to flock together. So if you're operating at a high efficiency, you know, and your attention to details there and your, your integrity is there, you're going to find other people that have those same qualities, those same, you know, values, and you're going to flock together. It's only natural that you become right. friends with them, right? But here's, a, I'll, t- I'll, I'll share this tidbit with you. And I think almost every restaurateur who's going to listen to this will go, Oh, shit, right, when they hear this. And uh, Halton, who is a very, very good educator from an industry perspective. First of all, they invest a ton of money in research and development. They're very into indoor well-being, right? So uh, they don't just make exhaust systems. They make uh, 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 indoor air systems. Uh, and they're all over the world. I think they're in 28 locations around the world. So it's not a one-of-a-kind in this little town. Um, but they had shared a, a study that was done uh, by this group called ASHRAE, which is the American Heating, Air Conditioning, Refrigeration Society, or so, I don't know what it, the acronym means, but it's something like that. Those guys actually um, sponsored a third-party independent study, and the result of this study um, was something like for every 10 degrees, the the that an environment is out of an employee's comfort zone, the employee's productivity drops by 30%. Now think about your family's old restaurant, right? And if you think about, you know, remember that old adage, hey, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, if you didn't like heat, you shouldn't have gone into the food service (laughs) world, right? But the fact is, if you really think about the result of that study, right? So for every 10 degrees, hot or cold, right? And maybe it was 12, but I think it was 10. I think that was the study. Productivity drops by 30%, right? To a restaurateur's labor, that means really for almost every three people in the kitchen, you need a fourth to pick up that drop in productivity. And if you think about what what that costs, 35 to 50 grand a year per person in the kitchen, that high efficiency hood system just paid for itself with that extra yeah, person. I'm happy I asked this question yeah. to have you go a little bit deeper in detail. Is there anything else that come that that came to mind that I don't want to cut you short? You said there were one or two things that came to mind. Uh, I don't know that that probably ties up the ventilator thought. But was there any other thing that's overlooked? Uh, yeah, well, I, I do think there is. Right, I think when when we look at um, you know, and again, a lot of it is um not visible to the naked eye. It is visible if you look at the spreadsheets, yeah, the right? Data, and right? you go, okay, yeah. yeah, these are real numbers. These are real dollars. And, you know, a lot of times when we talk to clients about, you know, listen, it could be a high efficiency oven or a high, there was a study years ago on high efficiency fryers versus regular gas fryers. And back then, just a regular gas fryer was, I don't know, 900 to 1300 bucks. And a high efficiency fryer was about $3,000. And back then, um, I think it was Pacific Gas and Electric back then uh, did, a, did a study on, on high-efficiency fryers versus regular. And the discharge, uh, they showed the efficiencies of the fryer. High-efficiency fryer was, I don't know, 84 85% efficient, meaning 84 85% of the energy spent went into the fryer oil. And the other one was about 50, 55% efficient. So what they were able to show is, is that the amount of heat waste coming out of the back of a flue of a fryer uh, equaled the cost of the high efficiency fryer over like a 20 month period. Like in 20 months, that fryer would have paid for itself. And then that savings would have been the restaurateurs for the life of that piece of equipment. And so You know, when people say, hey, I can't really afford this, it's like you can't not afford it, right? It's So we try and get them to think about some of these things differently, right? There's a first cost. There's a second cost. There's this ongoing utility, maintenance cost, longevity, not to mention the quality of the cook, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, things that... um, uh, that reduce shrink, right? So you're putting, you know, high cost proteins in, in a certain cooking vessel and it shrinks that protein by 27%. That's 20, for every $100, you've lost $27 in shrink. Yeah. Where there are other vessels that will shrink when you cook by 11%. So, you know, do you want to take 11 out of every $100 and let them go up the flu or do you want to take 27? And so I, I can't even tell you that every consultant 
spends the time because a lot of them, you know, are like I said, they're like other interior designers, architects, right? Kind of do the same thing over and over, copy, paste, rinse, repeat. And we're like, uh, listen, I want to learn something new. And one of the things that we do when there is a trade show or a conference like the National Restaurant Show or the NAFM Show or FCSI has a conference, we invest the money and we take everybody. Mm. And one of the things I tell our people uh, I, I said, every morning during this thing, we're going to meet for breakfast. And what I want you to do is tell me two or three things that you learned yesterday yes. that you didn't know the day before. Who did you meet? What did you learn? Share it with the rest of us. And to me, that's what helps to make people not only valuable to the firm to feel f part of the process, but it also makes us more valuable to the client. So when I can sit across like I'm sitting from you and talk to a client knowledgeably about these things fact factually right i can show them the data that supports this instead of saying oh yeah just pick manufacturer x over manufacturer y back to your timeline at this point we've gotten to the point that you've opened with, with the partner you found your partner you open you find a niche where it's it's kind of like ergonomics like looking at like how to to create operational efficient efficiencies with design and with uh with uh what's the word i'm looking for um design and even tools. theater, tools, but even theater, right? Maybe they're, uh, you know, because listen, when we started, all the kitchens were behind a wall, right? In the last 15, 20 right. years, right, the walls have been torn down and the kitchen is part of the show, the right? It's part of the theater. Yeah. So also, so are the people, right? right? The staff is also part of the right. show. So, you know, part of what we do is, is we work really hard with the architect and the interior designers in, in how do we meld that that shifting from front of house to back of house now that back of house is in the front of house and how do how can we help them to continue the architecture and the interior design versus just seeing kind of a line in the sand the architecture and the interior stops and everything else behind it becomes stainless steel nobody really wants that right people want it to feel like it's part of the architecture so we've worked really hard in in coming up with ideas and concepts where equipment can actually be finished and we've worked with manufacturers to to get some of that implemented where where stuff does look like a lot more finished in front of house and but still provides the same muscle you know as as it would as if it was back in the kitchen so what i'm hearing is is finding that like that blend you don't want it to be a hard <clears throat> line between front of house and back of house you want it to flow so like it there you really can't tell where the kitchen starts right and and the funny thing is is that that uh level of success in a project requires an incredible amount of collaboration so you know it's not it's not somebody like an ssa like a food service design firm or an architectural firm an interior design firm engineers lighting designer right just taking an idea and going back and working in their silo we have to share information on a regular basis and coordinate and collaborate this stuff so uh so everybody understands how it all comes together i love it um so one thing you mentioned earlier that i want to pull back some layers on i think there are some lessons that we can pull from this uh is that when you were just getting started it was you your partner and three employees so five total oh, oh yeah let me take it a couple of steps back so i originally started with a partner with a business partner and it okay. was just he and i okay and um he and i owned the firm together and and as we were exploring the market, right, actually uh, uh, acquiring projects within the market, the Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater market, um, I began to realize early on that there was really just a finite amount of work in a particular region, in this particular region. And I thought, well, you know, there's, there's more to this state than the Tampa Bay area and started kind of marketing and having meetings around the state and, and acquiring this is the 90s 1990s yeah this is like early 90s yeah. and uh then i realized well you know there's more to this country than than just florida and there's more to this world than just the united yeah. states and i just felt like a there was just much greater opportunity um and he didn't. I think he wanted to stay closer to home. I think he had other interests. He was not a designer. He was more of a business person. And I think it just got to a point in the business relationship where I think we both realized it wasn't for him. Okay. <laughs> and so I made an offer to very early on to just buy him out. Um, and the firm has r really been all mine ever since. And okay. uh, and yeah, so that was really happening like in the very early 90s. Was the firm SSA then? 
It was. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, was it, wh- what is the SSA? I tried to So find his it. last name is Schaefer. Okay. Mine was Schwartz. The firm was called Schaefer, Schwartz, and Associates. Okay. And everybody knew us as SSA. So when we did the split, I just changed the corporation to Schwartz, Schwartz, and Associates. And, uh, you know, everybody thought it was my, my father or my brother or a <laughs> grandfather. I'm like, no, they're just, we already had the logo. I just wanted to keep it simple. People <laughs> knew us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you bring up a really good point. And this is a thought that I had earlier in the conversation is that today, the power of being a specialist and there's so many verticals within the restaurant industry that you can be a specialist so whatever it is that you're good at and if you notice in in your four walls that you're really good at this one thing or even in your greater restaurant community or the 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 circle of friends that you roll in if you if you have a strength um and it's a unique strength take that strength and lean into it and take it to the masses because today in 2021 your marketplace is the world the point that you're making out like you like oh totally you can reach anybody with your specialized knowledge anywhere so lean into those 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 niches those strengths that you have and bring it to the masses because we're no longer limited by what's right out our front door it's the world and i think that it's it's just something that I can't emphasize enough that if you if you want to get if maybe opening a restaurant isn't for you but you love the industry lean into whatever your your strength is within the industry there's so much opportunity yeah because it could be listen you could be the director of F and B yeah. at a hotel or a large hotel chain right or uh, with an equipment manufacturer or or a food manufacturer or you know there's so many layers to our industry in marketing creating a podcast yeah. right i mean there's so, you know there's so many layers and it's really funny i this he's this guy's gonna kill me and it's funny when i say yeah i have a lot of friends in the industry uh one of my friends is the president of electrolux okay and uh a group of us went to the host show in milan a couple of years ago uh and i got asked to speak at a at a round table session with them and uh uh, Alberto and I were walking to the session together and uh, he said to me, he said a couple of things to me, which I'll share with you because I kind of, I kind of like how the conversation went. He said, he, he said, Ken, he said, I want to ask you something. He's like, you know, you have like a very dynamic group. He's like, you got quite a few young people. He said, he said, where do you find your young people? I said, well, we only advertise where they look. And he said, really, where is that? And I said, that's your first problem. You don't know where they look, right? And I said, but since you asked, I'll share with you. I said, we, t- we put together just a very clear, concise one or two lines, and we post them on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and we put them on LinkedIn. And I said, it's the only places we advertise. And I said, it's amazing the people that respond. And he said, very interesting. He said, you know, after this, he said, we're actually having a focus group of a bunch of young people to come in to actually talk to them about some of this. I said, well, I think you're on on the right path. And And it's funny because I do think that so many bigger companies have more senior level staff, senior being age, not time they've been with the company, who 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 aren't seeing things at a street level. And yeah. I don't necessarily mean a skateboarder, graffiti artist level, but a, a lot of clients ask us, well, how do you guys work? How do you work internally? And I tell people, I said, I said, everybody in the firm works on every project. Everybody has some hand in the project. And a lot of times what we do on a large conference room, we actually have a, a projector that projects onto the wall. So we'll project the building onto the wall that's painted with whiteboard. And we're like, hey, how do you think this should lay out? And, and I said, you know, we have somebody as young as 23. And I said, uh, one or two of us might be the oldest in early 60s. I said, but here's the thing. Everybody that works for us is a potential guest of one of our clients. Yeah. I said, I don't care if you're 23 or 63, you're a potential guest. And I said, therefore, you have perspective from a guest point of view. And I want to hear it because I want to understand. We had a, one of the guys when he said, well, how did you start the firm? And I said, yeah, I had an employee. This guy was a great designer. He worked for me for about 20 plus years, retired a few years ago. Um, and I'll never forget him saying, he's like, oh, you know, the young people, he's like, they're kind of full of shit. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, but a lot of it is just semantics. It's misunderstanding. And he's like, oh, that's bullshit. And I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, tell me your definition 
of a coffee shop. He's like, well, you know, come on. He's like, like a diner. He's like open 24 hours a day. You can go in in the morning. You can get a steak and potatoes. He's like, you can go at 10 o'clock at night and you can get eggs over easy. They got everything on the menu. Yeah. You know, the menu's an inch thick. He's like, that's a great coffee shop. I looked across <laughs> the conference table at the young person. I said, tell me your definition of a coffee shop. He's like, Starbucks. I said, see the difference? I said, so a lot of it is semantic. So back to Milan. So when we're walking to this conference in Milan, and Alberta looks at me and he said, he said, so I got to ask you something. He said, he said, what are the latest trends that you're following? And Eric, I got to tell you, I wrote this down after I said it because I couldn't believe the words just like spewed out of my mouth. And here's what I said to him. I said, uh, we don't follow trends. We create them. Yes. Right? Dude, and I he was like, oh, gosh. my God. Those are literally the words I was ac- echoing. Uh, well, it was funny because I said, hold on. I said, what did I just say to you? Let me. I got to write that down because I want our social media people to have. And he's like, he's like, no, pretty interesting. I said, well, you know, Alberto, I said, if you look at the stuff we design, I said, we never design the same thing twice. And I said, you know, probably one of our most well-known brands that we work for is uh, Hard Rock Cafe. We've designed probably half the Hard Rock Cafes around the world. There are n- no two that we've worked on that are alike. And in fact, one day they came to us and said, hey, Ken, we'd like you to design some prototypes for us. And I said, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> I'm like, none of your buildings are the same. Listen, sometimes we're in a historically protected 14th century building, you know, in Europe. And, uh, you know, maybe it's in Amsterdam or or we're in Brussels or in in Rome or something. And I said, you know, why, why would you want us to do that? They said, well, you know, because we have licensees, franchisees, we want to be able to show them some models. And we said, okay, we'll do this, but I, I don't think it's going to be relevant. Why don't you just show them projects that you've already done? But, you know, th- that was one of those things. And those have been some of the conversations that I've used before where we talked to a restaurateur and said, yeah, this is my third restaurant. What do I really need you for? I know what I want. And I say to them, listen, Hard Rock knows what they wanted also, but the industry changes, equipment changes, efficiencies change, and how are you ever made aware of them if you're not talking with somebody like me who can save you this two, three, four, fifty thousand $50,000 a year employees? Yeah, and the big things I'm pulling from what you just shared from us, that, that um, sprint we just went on, is that, and this is cross, I think this applies no matter what industry you're in, if you're, you gotta be where the people you're trying to recruit are. And I think this is a this is a, cop, a topic that comes up a lot within Restaurant Stoppable Network and just with, throughout the industry in general right now because people are hard to find right now. Um, it's really tough. People are still getting checks from the government. You know, it's it's hard as we start to reopen to find people. The the, the as the you know we, we accelerate back into normal. It's like the, the people just aren't quite there yet. So you got to ask yourself: Am I am I where people are? Am I, am I going to the schools? Am I hanging? Like, where are the young people in my community that I'm going to employ? Like, where are they going? Like, where can I put flyers? Like, where can I be seen by them? And no pun. How do we make working for us ap- more appetizing than working for a competitor? Yeah, and right. one thing you can do is offer, give, like, let the people know that you're going to listen to them because of the value of perspective. Give them a voice. Give them a seat at the table and let them know up front that you're willing to do that. And that's something that you've been doing, and that was the next thing I wrote down was perspective. Like we need to open up the potential energy of our team. And sometimes we just treat them like a cog in the wheel and we limit that potential energy because we don't give them a seat at the table. We don't ask them for their opinion, but we got to ask first. Yeah, and Eric, that's a good point, right? When you say we we limit them, right? And by limiting that, by limiting them, once, twice, over and over and over again, you eventually stifle them. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, you know, they're just a drone in the process. And I'll share another manufacturing example with you that's that I thought was amazing. Uh, a company in Germany, a manufacturer in Germany that makes equipment on a worldwide basis. I went over and visited them. Uh, And they have an incredible operation, and they actually make very, very good equipment. One of their initiatives is they have a suggestion box. And everybody who puts a suggestion box, and it doesn't matter if it's change the hand soap in the the employee bathrooms or can we get better drinks in the drink, whatever the suggestion is. If it's a valid suggestion, they give that person 10 euros for the suggestion. And every year they pick like the top, I don't know, five or six suggestions that actually make sense. And management says, hey, we really like these. Um, We want you to take it down the due diligence path a little bit. And they allow the the team to do that. In this particular case, this is a company that makes uh, combi ovens. uh, And uh, 
one of the suggestions was instead of taking the components of the inside cavity of the oven and clamping them together, welding them, and then you got to grind the weld and then you got to polish the weld completely smooth because you don't want to you don't want any ridges in the weld to hold moisture where bacteria would grow and then you blow it around the cavity yada yada yada. That process, I think, if I remember correctly, was taking for one cavity was taking like maybe four five hours a day per oven per cavity and this guy said I think we should invest in a robot you put all these pieces in a in a jig the jig goes into the robotic arm the robotic arm comes around welds it and the weld is so fine there's no grinding there's no polishing there's no nothing and by the way this thing cost what however many millions of euros but here's the payback and here's the thing and they implemented it. So when we were there, they had already bought it. It was already up and running. They showed us, and they showed this big smile on this guy's face. But for every one of those big ideas that get implemented, they get a 10,000 euro bonus that year. So now they got everybody there. Listen, the di so if you now equate this to like a restaurant, right? The waiter, the waitress, the hostess, the dishwasher, the stewards, right? The chef, the cook, the sous chefs, the line chef, Everybody in the equation is thinking, how do I come up with a better idea that makes this better for all of us because it makes it more profitable for the operation that gets shared with us? How do we do that? And I, I am not aware of one restaurateur that does that. And in my mind, they're crazy not to. And I get, oh, well, you know, we're only netting 2% EBITDA because our rent's too high. And I'm like, fucking change the yeah. portion and size. It's so <laughs> great. Um, I, I'm listening to this book right now, um, Abundance. The author's name is escaping me for some reason. But it was a book I'm listening to on my way down to Florida. And one of the biggest arguments that they're making in this book called Abundance is that the biggest um shortage of, of if there's a shortage of anything right now it's human potential because we limit people because we 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 don't allow people to the majority evolve, of people right? Let to evolve. contribute or yeah, to have yeah. a, a we are all so creative and we the the creative potential is limitless when you unleash it right so if we can if, if there's a shortage of anything it's it's stifled people who don't have a voice or a seat at the table that can offer a suggestion or a way out but when you open that up when you when you tap into all this potential energy and that's what a brain is it's potential energy when you tap into that and you create channels of communication and you invite this information you you invite this creative power it can solve so many issues not just within your business but world issues um it's it's really powerful stuff um what are your thoughts when i say that a couple of things come to come to mind right uh, and I'll share this with you, right? Because uh, I didn't always think this way and I didn't always behave this way. In fact, it was a lot of times, hey, here's my design. Here it is. Take it, run with it. I don't necessarily care what you think, right? You know, to the firm, I'd be like, evolve around this design. And I don't know, my wife will probably chuckle, you know, I don't know if it was actually from like a little uh, personal therapy that made me stop and start to appreciate people more and appreciate what they have to say and contribute. Uh, and I know, listen, in a, in a restaurant business, you, you know, in any business where there is little to no profit, I think the pressure is higher, right? Because every little hiccup is extremely costly mm -hmm. um, versus companies that have a little profit breathing room. And, and I think that's part of the problem with the food service industry. At what point did profit become a bad word in any business? At when when did profit become a bad word? Because if we don't have money, especially like for us, right, to invest in technology and, and to become better and to send our people to conferences and trade shows where they can learn more to help the client better, isn't that where the value is or is it just getting a cheaper product? Well, what you're seeing, what, one of the biggest issues, and this is also addressed in that book, Abundance, is that when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, most people's most basic needs are food. Uh, everybody's most basic needs are food and shelter, the things you need to stay alive, right? And then beyond that, it's security. But the restaurant industry only gets that second tier of, of solutions. We only solve food, shelter, and security, barely. Right. You can argue that second one, barely. <laughs> barely. And there's not enough excess to tap into like that creative power like because beyond beyond security it's being loved belonging we can do that but like until you get all those issues taken care of 
in cash the profit money can provide security it can it can it can free up other energy to to start focusing on peak like the peak things that you need like self actualization personal growth and th- that's where most restaurants don't go they they don't ever get to that level of focusing on the peak the self actualization the personal growth the the making people feel seen and loved and like they're contributing and like that's what every human needs um so we we always we're always falling short because there isn't because we don't focus on profit because we don't because profit can solve security profit can solve a lot of our problems but we never focus on it so we can never solve those issues i think they're so so exhausted from treading water for so long that it's like I can't see the edge of the shore. Like I just, yeah. I can't see it and at it's all. Right, it's usually right in front of their yeah. face. They're so close. Or it's like right behind you. Just turn yeah, around. Yeah. It's still, it's still right there. <laughs> so you know how do, how do we help people realize some of this? And and again, is it you know like I said before, is it you know modifying the portion size and the price, or is it is it buying the right tool that makes you more efficient that you don't see the money right away, but long term you know, the gains are incredible from it, right? And, you know, I, I, I think people who ask, you know, what's the price of that? Without really contemplating what is the cost versus benefit are shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, I'm loving this conversation. I still don't know if I got the answer to when you know it's time to scale. Well, the, you said you did a lot of research when ah. you were younger, and I think that's a lot of, a, a, that's a, a question that is universal. Um, and I'm sure the lessons you learned regarding that can be applied to some of the restaurant tours that are listening to this. So first of all, you got to have when to scale, right? That's the question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you have to have like the best crystal ball money can buy, right? Because it's it's um, you know again when you ask the question, you know what are the latest trends? Blah 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 blah. A trend didn't happen today, right? It evolved to a point where somebody or somebody's recognized and go, well, that's cool, right? Yeah. That's you, you know, so. There comes a, yeah, there is a sweet spot, right, where, you know, the business is good. Business is good enough where you can actually afford more people or afford to expand because it's not always about people. Maybe it's about more space or more tables and chairs or, or more production capability. So uh, scaling, I think, can be looked at in a couple of different, uh, different silos, right? And so the how and when to scale is, is determining – or anticipating, probably better, anticipating the need, right? Like like being able to look down the road a little bit and go, what do we think is going to happen? And I think when people think about following a trend or chasing competitors' technology, um, I don't think they're forward thinking, right? I think they're reactive, reactive right? Yes. They're totally reactive. And it was funny, back to Milan real quick. Alberto and I sit down at this big conference table, and there's a there's a, a pad and a pen there, and uh, he says to me, he said, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, they're going to stop teaching children in elementary school cursive writing, and I said, yeah, they've, there's been that discussion in the U.S. too, and I said, you know what that means, and he's like, no, what, and I looked down at the pad and the pen, and I said, well, if I own stock in BIC and or Mead paper, I'd be unloading my stock right away. I said, because the only people who are ever going to be using these are artists, right, or people who scribble or somebody who's got to jot down something or that weird person that you sit next to on the plane who's writing their journal while the plane's flying, right, <laughs> you know. So I, I said, you know, some of this stuff starts to become obsolete. So so in in your operation, when is what you're doing becomes obsolete? When is some of that stuff becoming obsolete? And it could be, how you operate, how your people work. It could be some of your equipment and, and how it works or doesn't work. And it could even be your menu item, right? Why, you, you know, if you're in, a, in a, 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 a New York or Chicago and there's two or three other restaurants in the block, why are you trying to do the same thing as the other people and compete? Do something different. What differentiates you, right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, taking that step back and I think that's the biggest problem I think operators, I think business people have, is stepping outside of where you are and looking in versus always being inside and trying yeah. to look out, yeah. right? So the things I always say when it comes to scale, the ones that rep- I repeat the most often is cash flow and people. You need the cash flow and people to scale. I think you could also argue, well, I know the more if I'm really sharing my opinion, I think 
cash flow people and culture because you can have cash flow you can have people but are they all aligned are they let all me tweak that if i can yeah, i'm gonna please. have you think about it differently since i studied the accounting and had to go through the bar mitzvah and all that because you got to be able to do like long division in your head before you actually <laughs> get the bar mitzvah paperwork <laughs> Change your term from cash flow to profit because okay. you can't spend cash flow. You can only spend profit. profit. I love it. And I think that's an, that's an important point for business people because I think a lot of business people get pie-eyed. Oh, my God, our business is doing so great. We got all of this money coming in. But they honestly don't know if they're operating at a profit or a loss, even though the cash is flowing right? You got to know how much of that is profit and of that profit, how much of that is available for you to invest in people, things, widgets, more space, etc. So let's say people, profit, culture. And the last thing that I just gained from you is opportunity. Yeah. I love that. Now, and opportunity to me is uh, being open, open minded, eyes open, ears open for opportunity. Um, but a lot of it is you have to be willing to receive it, mm. right? You got to be in a position to receive it. And I don't necessarily mean a financial position. You just, you know, it's like embracing somebody, right? You can't give somebody a hug if your arms aren't open, out and open, right? Yeah. If they're crossed, you can't, you can't embrace them. So you got to be open to embracing new ideas. Yeah, and that's, I, I, and like, when I, I love that you're saying that because that echoes one of our core values, which is we are students. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to communicate when I say we are students is we have to be open to perspective. We have to realize we don't have all the answers because once you think that you know it all, the process of learning stops. And it, you never, you have to be open to everything and consider all the possibilities. And that's one of the biggest trends I've seen in successful people, they never stop growing. They're always looking for the next opportunity. I, and I, I believe that too. I think you're, you're either ever evolving or you're slowly dying Yeah. because there's not a, there might be a, a little bit of a resting point in between, but I think it's minute. Yeah. And so uh, I also have this other saying that I got from my oldest brother who's a CPA and I kind of like this too. You're either producing or you're consuming. Mm-hmm. You, you're not, you're not, there's not a middle in there. Yeah. And I think, I think you can look at that in terms of profit, but you can look at that in terms of growth and it can be financial growth. It can be personal growth. It can be business growth. It can be operational growth. It can be all those things. But I think people have to, again, take a step out and look in and determine where you are and what you have and what, what is actually working well and what's not. I'll share this with you real quick. I, uh, one of the um, FCSI conferences, I was the conference chair, so I got to pick the speaker. And we picked this speaker, and I'll, I'll never forget this. I th this is when I thought, I'm definitely in the wrong business. We picked this speaker, and it was, uh, was $15,000 for him to come speak for uh, an hour and a half. We had to provide... In the wrong business. Wait, no, listen to this. <laughs> so we had to provide two first-class tickets, two hotel room nights, and 15 grand, right? And so I got to chat with him a little bit before his session and just, and he was a business consultant, like very sharp. And I said, uh, you know, we're happy to have you here, blah, 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 blah. How often do you do this? And he's like, I'm booked the 28 out of the next 30 days. And I'm like, Jeez. 28 times 15,000. I'm like, take the rest of the year off, buddy, like after <laughs> yeah. this. But he said something incredibly important during his whole speech. I don't remember any of it except I remember this. And he said, you have to evaluate your business every year, and every year you have to get rid of the bottom 15% of your clientele. Clientele, customers, tag them however you want. And I came back and I thought about that, and I'm like, he's crazy. Like, why would I give this business? Why would I? Why would I give this business up? Like, like I have the business. It's coming in our front door. We like working with these people, and I kept thinking about it, like, like month after month probably for three or four years, I talked to my brother who was our firm CPA. And he's like, you know, it's not really wrong. He said, it's much easier to say than to do. But then I sat back at the at a year end. And I actually did a report that showed um, fees and profit uh, by client. And I started to look at it. And I started to see a trend in in which clients were least profitable. And why were they least profitable? They required the, the most amount of time and consumed a majority of the fee. And it took another couple of years, and we said this every year, uh, I, I said, okay, at the end of this year, we're no longer taking on these type of projects ever again. We're not going to do it. 
and the year would start and we get a call like all right we'll do it and next thing i know we're doing 20 of those projects in a year and the end of the next year i'd say the same thing over why did we take those projects on it took another three or four years i think before we finally said no mas beginning of next year we're going to give it a hard no we're not going to do it and so we stepped away from those types of projects and what i immediately realized is it freed up staff time expertise the people who were doing those types of projects didn't like them they were burnt out on them uh they didn't like that part of the industry and i kept thinking to myself my god why didn't anybody say anything to me right and maybe they felt like well i'd lose my job or you know i'm not part of the team this way and it was like this immediate like sigh of relief and so i take that with me i share it with a couple of people to really have them sit back and consider your whole, here's your business as a whole. Now break it up into pieces. And listen, if you are a restaurateur, right, it could be your day-to-day sales is great. Your, your off-site catering is great. Your delivery business is great. All of these things are great. At least you think they are, right? Because money is flowing from it. But then when you come down and start to actually look at the individual profitability of those, there may be one piece of this that is incredibly profitable that you didn't think it was, another piece where the sales are really high and you thought was great, but the profit's extremely low, but you don't know unless you do the math, right? To actually look at it and have a sense of where you are. And so I think it's important for people, again, to take a step back and spend some time to understand what pieces of their business work best. Yeah, and I can't help, and I don't know if there's any relation here, but there might be with the 80-20 rule that, you know, 20%, or sorry, eighty percent of your profit usually comes from twenty percent of your employees or your your business customers right? your or business. Customers. Yeah. So if you're if you're removing what do you say eighteen percent? Fifteen percent. So if you're removing fifteen yeah. percent of your least lowest performing, uh, you know, channels of profit, then you're opening it up more room on the front end for new opportunity, right? That's the other thing, right? And that's a really good point because you were so busy with all of these other things, you didn't even have time to even consider that there could be some other opportunities. Now you freed up this time, right? Bandwidth. You freed up some resources to go, wow, I never even thought about pursuing this, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder if that also holds true to what we hear, like always be hiring, always be hiring. And always, in the, like if, you, if you're taking, if you look at that, that, you take that same mentality and you apply it to your lowest performing employees, you know, like, and, and if they're not performing and the, the, whatever the bottom 15% of your employees are, then that leaves you room to bring in more talent. I don't know. Well, then, you know, maybe that's a little cold hearted. It could be, <laughs> but, but, but you also make a good point, right? So again, if you do the work and you say, okay, who are my top performing employees and who are the bottom performing employees? The big question is why are they bottom forming employees? Is it because we're not giving them the opportunity to grow? We're not giving them the tools to grow or because everybody's just shut them down to the point that, you, you know, they're just deflated and they're just here going through the motions every day because nobody's asking them to participate, to be inclusive in terms of the process or the business. And I think that that's part of it. You know, it's, it's whether it's a restaurant or a design firm, it's all a collaborative team and everybody, listen, nobody ever really thinks about the dishwasher. But if the dishwasher's back in the kitchen and it, you know, and it's hot and steamy back there, where I go to that hole if it's ten degrees out of the the comfort zone, right? And oh yeah, we got a dish machine from the chemical company, right? And it it doesn't work worth a shit because, you know, it requires more chemicals because that's how the chemical companies make more money, you know. Brought to you by Ecolab, <laughs> right? But you know, but those are very inefficient, very inexpensive machines. I actually think this episode is being sponsored by Procter and Co. So, <laughs> but uh, if you think about the guest experience, we've all been in a restaurant where a dish has come out, and we've said, "Hey, sorry, there's like something on the plate." Well, what you don't realize that's still food from the previous wash cycle that's still on your plate because they have an inferior dish machine. Right. The good news is it was high, high temp or high chemical sanitized. So whatever food is crusted on there is completely safe. (laughs) But you look back and it's, you know, it's a couple of black marks for the restaurant. So if the if what a lot of people see is the lowest common denominator in in a kitchen being the dishwasher, which I don't think so. I think they're as vital part of the team as everybody else isn't inspecting every dish that comes out of the dishwasher to make sure it's absolutely clean and pristine. Right. Just like the perfectly cooked filet or 
piece of fish or whatever it might be. Think about that, right? Here's a here's a fifty eight dollar steak or you know a forty six dollar piece of fish that goes on a plate that's not completely clean because the dishwasher didn't check it or the machine wasn't of a quality to get it clean the first time, and that comes out and it gets sent back. Yeah. What does that cost the restaurant? What does it cost them in profit? But what does it cost them in credibility? Right. Right. And that and that's the most hardest thing to track right there, right? The intangibles, um, credibility. Like how do yeah. you? track that i don't know but i'm loving this conversation um we do have to think about wrapping it up soon but before we go to the speed round um is there anything that has not been discussed or anything when we're thinking about our 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 listener out there the aspiring restaurateur the person who's trying to grow the independent restaurant operator a few one one unit to maybe five or six units is our average listener what advice do you have for them um that hasn't come out of this conversation so far well, you know, it's funny when we were talking about spreadsheets and numbers and all of that. Um, I, I, you know, I think you need to have a strong business plan before you start, you know, and, and um, I've used this analogy. Like in the early days, I remember having this, this client, this client, a husband and wife come in um, and, and they wanted to open up a restaurant. Back in the day, we would design sandwich shops, right? And, you know, we would take whatever business there was. Yeah. And uh, first thing I asked them is, you know, what do you know about inventory control? And they're like, we're not a retail store. Come on, we're going to be a restaurant. My wife here makes the best chicken salad, and I make. And I said, "All right, let's go back to what do you know about inventory control?" And they said, "Why are you asking that?" And I said, "Well, think about this." And I look at the husband. I'm like, "You know, you got pretty good hand, big hands." And I looked at this lady, and I said, "You know, you're a very small person." And I said, and I come in on the day that you're working and I order a ham and cheese sandwich and you have no inventory control and you grab a mound of ham and you put it on my sandwich and your, your I'm going to say imaginary business plan because you don't really have one, really calls for four ounces of ham, but you gave me seven because your hand is so big. Yeah. And I look at that and I'm like, wow, this is a great sandwich, right? It's like full of meat. It's gigantic. I come back next week because I'm like, that was really great. And I felt like it was a really good value. And I order from your wife who has tiny hands and I get three ounces because that's a handful for her. Yeah. Right. No inventory control, no portion controlling. And I go sit down and I'm thinking, I just got ripped off. But the fact is, I said, you guys under under uh, made the sandwich by 25 percent when she made it. And you more than doubled it when he made it. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's why the inventory control is important But what's re- from a profit standpoint. But now look at it from my guest perspective. Inconsistent. Point, right? And, and I, said, I said, destined to fail. And I said, so we, when you look at the statistics, right, around the state of Florida, around the country, like the National Restaurant Association, pre-COVID, of, you know, the number of new openings that would close in the first 12 months, I think the biggest part of it is lack of planning. And planning also includes capital. So, so when we put together a business plan for a client, uh, we, uh, we go through all of the revenue streams and put together revenue streams with the client, right? We want input from them. It's like, you know, what are you going to charge for an entree? What are you going to charge for a side? All of that stuff we plug in, plug it in by, by days of the week, meals by day, number of seats, number of turns, all that we project out. And, and then we... Uh, uh, subtract from that uh, what we think are potential costs. And and there is what's called a ramp up to financial sustainability because we say, listen, on day one, you are not operating at 100% revenue, but you are operating at almost 100% expense. So there comes a time, right? The expenses are high and revenue is, is low, but there comes a time where revenue will cross, hopefully, right? Hopefully cross over the expenses. That's your point of break even. That's the day, the moment where this operation becomes financially sustainable, where it will support itself, where it's breaking even and even earning a profit. And I'll ask people, why do you think that's important? And they're like, well, we don't know why. And I said, so what is the period from opening day to the day that the profit line crosses over the expense line? They said, well, we don't know. I said, you have to know that. We have to be able to project it. Is it, is it a week? Is it a month? Is it six months in a week? Is it a year and a half? Because all of those months previous to that point, you're actually losing money and we're projecting how much you're losing. That loss has also has has to be capitalized. You have to have the capital to be able to 
buy food, the runway. pay the employees, pay the rent, right? It's, yeah, the runway is a good way to put it. Yep. And I said, and, and unless that's part of your business plan, you have no idea where you need to be and when. You just think, here's what we need to do to make money. But you don't realize that that's not happening on the first day. Yeah, and, it's going to take some time. And what you just described is exactly why when I'm interviewing people, they say you need to, whatever you think it's going to cost to start a restaurant, double it. <laughs> well, you don't have to. You just have to have a strong business plan. And when we work on business plans, we take an ultra conservative approach mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we don't want it to be pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. People are making real money, big dollar investments in these things. And we want them to have a clear understanding with an achievable goal that is this business plan. Hopefully the business plan is the roadmap that gets them to financial sustainability and profit. And we want it to be reasonable, right? We want them to understand because, you know, if you go to the rich uncle or your business partner or the bank or whoever, and you say, here's our business plan. We know that this is going to do really well, but we have to capitalize some portion of this for the first, you know, four and a half months. You know, and we even put a contingency factor in there. So, you know, there's a little bit of a buffer. But if you haven't planned for that and by month three, you're completely out of money with no other resources. I love that. It's it's that investment is like, you know, like the magician with the flash paper. Poof. It's just <laughs> like when you pay taxes and you just send the check and it just like disappears. Yeah. That's what happens to their investment. I'm loving this conversation. One more thing I'm really curious about because you have a unique perspective. And then we'll go to the speed round. Uh, if you had your own crystal ball right now and you're looking into the future with everything that's happened in the past year, uh, where do you see the industry going? Like what's what's your crystal ball telling you and what actions or moves are you making to be prepared for the future? So I think things are going to ramp up pretty quickly uh, in the food service industry world, in the travel world, in the hospitality world. Um, the good news is uh, with COVID, unlike the downturn of the economy in 08 and 09, uh, when the financial markets closed, right, they froze up. Uh, that didn't happen during the pandemic. So the financial markets are still open. They're lending institutions out there who still need to lend money. Y you know, it's they make money lending money. So if they're not lending money, guess what? They're hurting. <laughs> they're hurting like the rest of us. Yeah. So a lot of our developer clients uh, see this as a great opportunity, a great time to be designing and planning because a lot of these things that we're designing now will not be built and up and running for another 12 to 24 months. So, you know, this will be in our rear view mirror and, you know, we'll be moving forward. But I think for people who have closed to or who have re or going or anticipating reopening, regardless of what they've done, I think it's time to sit down and build a concrete business plan, right? You know, again, they don't need me to look at their financials or their tax returns and go, you know, for the last seven or eight years, you know, you've been sucking wind. They don't need an outside expert to, I mean, you could almost get like a fifth grader to look at that and go, yeah, there's a minus sign in front of those numbers. You must not be doing very well. But to self-evaluate and go, all right, we, we really need to change our approach on this and then maybe get some assistance, right, in, in, in making sure it's fine-tuned into something that's achievable. To me, now is the time, I think, to plan really, really well with a solid yet conservative plan to move forward. Yeah. And, and I listen, um, we're busy. We're getting busier. Um, we, we see what's on the horizon for us uh, in the development and the food service world. Uh, and I'm here to tell you uh, it's exciting and uh, refreshing. And thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have one follow-up question then to speed around. And I, I agree with you 100% that you need a plan. You need a strategy. But I also, that it's, and it's the, this is one of the biggest lessons I learned doing this podcast. So there's always a piece of advice that completely counter counters another piece of advice. Right, right, right. So the other piece of advice is just start. Don't over plan. What's the balance there between just getting started and finding that balance with having a plan and a strategy? Well, you know, if you're, and my wife will laugh at this too, if you're kind of a, a Instagram junkie like some people are, I may not be, you know, and you see a lot of these kind of inspirational phrases and stuff like that who say, you know, dreaming and not doing is whatever, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, the first thing to do is start or first step or start running or yeah. what, what, whatever your thing may be. Um, but you got to plan for it, right? You're, you're um, you know, it's funny, you, you're not going to go out on a run 
in pitch black dark, right? You're not going to go out on a, a cycling in pitch black dark. Uh, you're not going to go for a swim. And when I say pitch black, void of light, right? Yeah. No street light. <laughs> it's, right? It's, you know, you're not going to go hiking on a mountain in pitch black dark, right? I, I think anybody who is going to invest in any business, right? Whether you, you're going to buy stock in the stock market or you want to buy into somebody's business, if you don't do your due diligence and due planning, you're probably equally as well off to just go to Vegas and pick red or black because yeah. I think your your chances of making money are probably better in Vegas than they are in that enterprise. Yeah. You have got to plan because part of your planning is is a map that also not only is it your guide but it lets you know if you're if you're kind of fading off course before line. you get too far off course that again the off course can be extremely costly but so can the return and so i think it's this great guide right kind of like the lines in the street that kind of keep you in between from point a to point b point a is is starting day and yeah. listen starting day is not opening day Starting day is the day you start spending your first dime. So mm -hmm. you hire food service designer, architect, engineer. The day you start writing checks is A. Yeah. Point B is actually the day you open. And you want that to be as short as possible. So, again, that requires some planning before you start spending. Or you can be in the design phase much longer than you want. Yeah, I love that. We're back, and the first question I have for you is, what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a, char a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Attention to detail. What is your biggest weakness? Attention to detail. Uh, I love it. It's, it's <laughs> always so often that your biggest strengths are your biggest weaknesses. So, you know, the funny thing about detail is, right, a lot of times uh, detail can be a solution. and But a lot of times a solution, one solution to a challenge creates this ripple effect of other challenges yeah. so you have to be careful but you have to be you have to be open enough to recognize it. i feel like that's human humanity's biggest challenge right there we're always trying to solve problems with details and in doing so we create more problems and we're like oh we didn't think about that we didn't have to <laughs> right that. right um what is your or one question you ask or thing you look for when you're building your team so for us uh it's it, you know we advertise for a certain amount of experience but for us, it's fitting within our brand. And our brand is, you know, always do great work. Don't take ourselves too seriously. So, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, you know, like, I'm can be this and I'm going to be that and I'm going to do this and you're going to find I'm the, and I'm like, yeah, we're not an I, we're a we, right? Yeah. And you got to you gotta fit in. And so one of the interesting things we do here is myself or uh, uh, David, uh, we will we will kind of do a first interview with somebody. And we, if we feel like there's an interest or this person can make the cut, then everybody else interviews them. Okay. And then I get a vibe from everybody else. Hey, how do you think this person's going to fit in? Because the other thing is, listen, uh, a, a new dynamic team member can be fantastic. But one who, you know, is a wrench in the gears can be a huge problem. And, and a lot of times, and again, listen, I only know what I know. So I'm getting it from their perspective also. <laughs> yeah. So I want to hear. I love it. That's great advice. What is your, sorry, go ahead. And I was going to say, if you ask my wife, she'll probably tell you I'm a terrible judge of character. <laughs> so it's good for me to have like yeah. some backup. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is one of your biggest challenges today? Uh, travel. And how are you overcoming that? Well, I'm starting to travel. Yeah. Um, but, you know, half more than half the world is still closed. Yeah. And so uh, I'm anxious to get back out in the in the real world. Because, again, you know, a, a lot of our work, a lot of our clients, a lot of the design team, this this is a, a heavy relationship, collaborative effort, what we do. Uh, and doing it on a Zoom or a go to. Uh, is difficult at best to, yeah. to get that level of collaboration. I believe you. And there's something that there's something to be said about being in person. And we had this conversation before we hit record today. It's just you know sitting across from somebody, the body language, the it's just it's just so much more impactful. And I think there's a lot of convenience in the world we live in right now. Uh, but I think we lose a lot of connectivity in the process of and we're, we're trading connectivity for convenience, which well, is you know exactly. We're working on a big hotel. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it's like 17, 18 venues and, you know, the design team is all working remotely. Everybody's working remotely. And we sent a, a, a phase of our documents called design development, 
to the design team that went to the client and you know we have these weekly calls and the design team is looking for the client to sign off including f and b to sign off on all the f and b and yeah well i haven't got into it or you know this is a lot to look at and i said i said guys i said i'm happy to travel i said if you want to meet i'll come sit you with you we'll do a page turn we'll go through area by area and they said you would do that i said we need to do this, right? Yeah. I said, you're going to spend $250, $300 million to build a new hotel that you're not confident that you have what you want. It doesn't mean you. It's what we have designed in isn't what you want. You're just not looking at it from a right perspective to really be able to understand it. And if you want me to come and walk you through it, we'll spend the time. And so that's what I did. I flew up to Philly, sat with the client for more than half a day, and we went sheet by sheet, area by area, and, you know, got them to sign off on it with a couple of notes, but we'd still be waiting around. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's really, it, it's, it is that human yeah. interaction. And that's another thing. Like, mm. things happen when you show up in person. And that's one of the reasons why I'm willing to drive across the country. Because I know that if I show up in Florida, I'm going to start talking to people. And they're going to start saying, oh, you, have you talked to this person or that person? Or have you considered this? And when you show up, there's something about people being willing to show up for you. And to, to finish the job and to connect you with people. And it's, there's just so much more weight there. I don't know. And I think we, we lose sight of that sometimes. But I think we can move on to the next yeah. question. <laughs> uh, share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. Again, like the, like the work has got to be pristine. And there is no exception to that. What's one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? So this is a way that you go above and beyond that might be common within your firm but not common across other firms. So, you know, put the creativity differences and, you know, getting the work done on time. Put all of those differences aside. Um, I think for us, really spending the time to think about things logically, right? It's not just, it's not just populating a space with equipment, right? It's, it's actually thinking it through. How is it going to work? How will, it, how will the client see it? How will the client use it? And have, we, and have we given them the best tool in terms of design and how do we massage it around? And one of the things we always do internally is review each other's work. And we've had people that have worked here in the past who were highly critical of that. And I said, listen, if you can't take criticism from within, what's going to happen when, when our work gets outside and people start criticizing it? And I said, I don't want to give them that opportunity. And I said, I want other eyes to look at it and provide input before yeah. we release it. Something that we, we talk about a lot in the network is you got to check the checklist checker. Yes, yes, for the yeah, exactly. Checker. I like checker. that. Yeah, uh, And it's true. Uh, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant operator? Oh, here's a good one. Uh, who moved the cheese? Who moved my cheese? Yeah. Is that um, the same as uh, the one minute manager? Same author? Uh, maybe, I, I maybe, mean, might be. yeah. Uh, Kim Blanchard or something like that, or M maybe. I'm not sure. We'll link to it. What, what's the big lesson from that book? Um, I think we said it before, right? Keeping your eyes and ears open, but also keep staying open-minded, right? Because I think if you're closed-minded, you're you're not in a position to receive. Mm -hmm. What is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough? Clean. <laughs> <laughs> Name one service you've hired or outsourced to. That we outsource. Yeah, this is to? typically a question for restaurant owners. So it's like something that you. So for example, they would say SSA design because that's not what they do. They outsource to it. So who's um, or maybe it's a, a firm or a company that you think restaurant tours should outsource to this if they haven't yet. Wow. I. I you know what I think. Um, I think I'm going to say human resources mm. because, again, you know, like when I tell you, you know, my wife would be holding up a big sign, you know, terrible judge of character. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people are very great, are very good business people. They're very good chefs. They're very good restaurateurs. They're very good designers. They're not necessarily good teachers or good people managers um, or, you know, when it comes to management of, of um required protocols and documents relative yeah. to employees outsource that why yeah. why you know why work all day and all night and then go home and work all night on that stuff is just, there a, is there sorry go ahead just pay somebody to do yeah. it yeah is there a specific company that comes to mind when you say hr no not really so i'll i'll share a couple that have come to my mind or come up on the show people matter uh harry 
and I got a I think gusto for payroll. And I got to give a shout out to Carrie Luxem, who's my go to HR lady. Uh, and if you guys join the network, uh, you can get two months of free access to, to Carrie's membership site where she has all of her like best practices, HR A through Z over there. And that's a value of a hundred dollars. Just throwing that out there. A little love to our girl, Carrie Luxon. <laughs> um, all right. This is almost the last question. What is one technology that you think a restaurant tour should adopt in their business? Oh my God. Best question ever <laughs> for the love of God. Get your people handheld devices. Like in this day and age, and it's funny, uh, my wife is from Europe, so we traveled to Europe a lot. Uh, this summer in August, we were in Spain for five five weeks, Spain, uh, August and September. Uh, and the only way I could travel over there is because I'm married to somebody from Europe, so I was the exception. <laughs> I could actually get into Europe. But everywhere in Europe, uh, every every little cafe comes up with handhelds, right? In the server, what would you like? Yeah. Right, Ken? Eric, what would you like? No problem, right? Walk away. And the, yeah, uh, excuse me, can we get the bill? They come over, you tap your credit card on it, and you're done, right? You can add a tip and walk, sign it and walk away. When you think about that from a guest experience level, yeah, it's not the same as the old, you know, paper check in the American Express book, American Express, who I love dearly, by the way. But now if you think about this post-COVID, right, how many people want to touch those guest no checkbooks, one. right? Nobody. Who wants to touch the pen that you got to use to no. sign? Nobody, right? <laughs> but the other thing is, if you think about it in, in the States, where almost everybody is using the traditional method, there's very few places I go where they actually have the handhelds, it's, right? It's surprising. Uh, who do you think is doing it best? Toast. Yeah. I think Toast does. But if you think about this from an operator perspective, an owner, right? Better guest experience, right? The guest can... Ask the order's done right away. Prints in the kitchen. There's no, you know, the the servers. The, the POS. well, the servers walking back to the yeah. POS and the other tables. Excuse me, I need you for a minute, right? Yeah. And the next, and then the next the table, already in. right? And yeah. it's like you hey, haven't even taken my order, and now I see you doing other things, right? Yeah. Now I'm getting a little aggravated, right? Mm -hmm. The order is already in. The order comes, right? The person gets pinged. Check with table 58. Hey, how is everything? Right, so they can ping them. How is everything? Ping them again 10 minutes later. Hi, would you like to order desserts, coffee, after dinner, drink? Or can I prepare the bill for you, right? Oh, please prepare the bill. Boom, here it is. I think you actually get better upsell because people aren't waiting. Go, hey, listen, I've waited like 15 minutes for the server to come by. Yeah. We're not going to order drinks. We're not going to order dessert. So you've lost that opportunity. You know, And then you got to wait another 10 minutes because like, you've given them the check. They got three other <laughs> checks. And you haven't given up the table, yeah. right? You could have turned the table already. I think that is a great solution. I think that the, as a result of COVID-19, absolutely even more so. But I think even beyond that, a, a lot of things have, we've been forced to change because of these regulations and we're trying to be safe. But I don't know if you've heard of Bebot, but now because everybody has their own personal cell phone, they, they everyone, all of our customers have a device. They can yeah. place the order themselves. I like that. It's actually funny. We have a, a, a client that we're working with uh, on designing a food hall. Uh, and the client also owns a, a technology company. He bought all the way. And he has uh, developed uh, an app uh, that I'm actually presenting to other food hall clients who are like, oh, my God, this will completely change the way food halls are done. And uh, I, I think it's actually helping to sell the food hall projects because the traditional food hall in my mind, is the worst guest experience ever. You and I go in, you want barbecue, I want a burger, you and we, div table, we meet in the divide middle. and conquer. <laughs> well, no, before we ever That's get to right. the table, right? You go to your counter, I go to mine, you're queuing behind eight people, I'm queuing behind 10, finally place the order, pay, stand there, maybe there's a pager, maybe they're going to beat my phone or whatever. Finally, the order comes up, I got to find you, we got to find a table. Again, we finally get a table, we're chatting, we're eating, Hey, uh, let's get a cappuccino or a dessert. Oh, let's look at the dessert place. There's 20 people in the line. <laughs> Forget it, right? Yeah. They've lost the incremental sale. Yeah. It is the worst operation ever, and it can be so easily fixed now, with technology. Now, with Bebot, you, you, you find the table. There's a QR code for every restaurant. 
or I don't even know if it'd be every restaurant, but there's a QR code you select your restaurant. They, they it knows which QR code you scan, so, so now they know which table exactly where yeah, you're yeah, sitting, yeah, yeah. and yeah. they just bring it out. Yeah. Uh, and it integrates with Toast POS and other right other. POS I think systems. I think it's yeah. going to change how we do things. And this isn't just because Bebot's sponsoring the show, right? I now. never heard of them, by the and way, but I love them already. <laughs> yeah, I'll introduce <laughs> you. I'll be I'll be very happy to introduce you. Um, so this is the last question. It's a doozy. Get ready for it. All right. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow all the memories of you your work your restaurants your designs would be lost with your departure with the exception of three pieces of wisdom that you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy what would those three pieces of wisdom be Hmm. it's a deep one wow (laughs) the looks i get asking this question i think i would take it outside i i would take it more global right uh love each other respect each other, embrace each other. I love it. This has been a great conversation, Ken. We wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. That's how I found you. Rudy Mick called you out. He knew I was coming to Florida. He said, you got to talk to Ken uh, from SSA. So who do you respect and admire in this industry? Somebody preferably in Florida while I'm still here, I can connect with them that you think would make a great guest mentor like you made for us today. I think, um, I think Richard Gunsmart from the Columbia Restaurant Group, uh, and I'll tell you why. I, I mentioned to you, my family got started in 1897. Uh, down the street, Richard's uh, family opened up their first little cafe in 1905, and they've been operating restaurants ever since. Our families have re- uh, retained relation- friendly relationships ever since and business relationships. And in fact, uh, we just designed an uh, a new restaurant, a new Italian restaurant for them that opened up just like a, two months ago. It was designed and built during COVID. And uh, they're incredibly successful. Uh, Richard's fourth generation. I'm fourth generation. And uh, his daughter and nephew that are also in the company are fifth generation. And uh, my son that works in the firm here is fifth generation. Awesome. So it's kind of it's kind of cool. But um, they're, just, uh, they're just in Florida, different uh, uh, Tampa. Uh, they have a few restaurants here in Tampa. Sarasota, uh, Saint Ar- yeah, and Saint Armand Circle, uh, Sand Key, and Saint Augustine, uh, and just on the outskirts of in, of Orlando in a little town called Celebration that's right outside of Disney, uh, but but incredible, um, an incredible operator with an incredible family business story. And that was Richard Dunbar. Gunsmart. Gunsmart. G O N Z M A R T. Beautiful. Look out, Richard. I'm coming after you. I'd love to get you on the show. I'll and, connect you guys. And how can we connect with you? If we listen to this episode and we're thinking about, we have some big projects on the horizon. We want to outsource for design and we, we would like to co- connect with you. What's the best way to connect? Um, uh, hit our website, studiofs.com, studiofs, like food service.com. Um, or you can hit us up on Instagram at uh, SSAFSD. Um, or call us. Yeah, and make sure you stick around for the closing thoughts. I'll be sure to mention which episode number this is, so you can head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash whatever the episode number is, and we'll have a summary of today's discussion, as well as links to any tools, services, or books recommended and how to connect with Ken over there. Again, Ken, thank you so much Thanks, sir. Uh, for taking the time to, to share your story, your knowledge, and your mentorship. Yeah. There is no questioning, my man. You are unstoppable. Thanks, man. We'll cut it there. Thank you. Mm-hmm.